Hi again, this is Stacey Sanderson coming back as promised to revisit the idea of a narcissistic family system. We use this term system uh, because of the way that families operate with different parts and functions to meet different needs. And so what I mean by this is often the origin of narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder, is of course rooted in family systems with attachment mechanisms being part of that process, being part of the development of self and being part of the development of psyche and of course being part of neurocognitive development. I really, really believe that those who are high in traits of narcissism and those certainly who meet the criteria for NPD have a different brain structure. Their neofrontal cortexes, the prefrontal cortex, the areas of self-awareness and the areas of other awareness right, are not quite as developed. And I think there are all kinds of reasons for why we've seen narcissism develop in the culture. And I think that it probably even goes back to, you know, some of the original myths and scriptures and stories that are embedded in the collective psyche. It's, these are stories we all know. Um, from our faith histories, from fairy tales, you know, it's very, in many ways, it's very familiar to us, which is interesting, because we then are all still shocked when someone <laughs> behaves characteristically narcissistic. But I want to come back into talking about, you know, narcissistic families. There are, I believe, some parallels and similarities between narcissistic families and narcissistic workplaces or corporate narcissism. Um, and, and mainly because narcissists go into the workplace and their insecurities drive a repetition of those patterns or their grandiosity drives it or their need for ego supply drives it. Um, and then there are the rest of us, right, or some who may be neutral and unaffected. But for those people who were wounded in narcissistic families, we also repeat those patterns. And I'll talk more about that in a different video. We can talk about narcissism at work. But for now, we're going to talk about what does it look like in a narcissistic family. I think where I see this the most often in my practice, unfortunately, is with really brutal, traumatic separation and divorce stories. And then a system, meaning family court system, that repeats those traumas of the person who is wounded, not being heard or believed, of buying the narcissist's lies or stories or false narratives, and of children, particularly young children, their needs being overlooked. So within a narcissistic family, children's needs can be hyper-focused on or disregarded entirely, depending on how it serves the needs of the narcissistic parent. Before I forget, I am going to make a point here that this exact dynamic plays out within separation and divorce and within the proceedings of that itself. And then within the machinations that go on as the non-narcissistic parent is just trying to cooperate and work together. And so the narcissist need to win <laughs> and the need to maintain ego supply just keeps on going and it doesn't change even though I know how much people want it to change. So again, I'm just characterizing and sharing the, the most toxic dynamic that I hear the most often. Of course, worse than that, Although the two overlap would be, and I think I mentioned this last time, grooming and emotional incest. So what this, this means two things. 
This means an adult confiding in a child who is not neurocognitively developed enough to have boundary strength, okay? In an extreme, it could be about incest or sexual abuse. I'm not talking about that now. But it, um, it is a child meeting that adult's ego needs. I think this gets worse when the family fragments because of divorce. That doesn't mean I don't think you shouldn't divorce. That's not what I'm saying. But I think that there's a heightened risk of that grooming and manipulation after the separation and divorce. And the second thing that happens is that the narcissist can vacillate between grandiosity and despair within that process. What I see all the time is they will say and have a narrative that they don't get to see their kids when in reality, they are the deadbeat parent who isn't fulfilling their court mandated obligation. A divorced family is still a family, right? There are changes in the roles and obligations, right? And ideally, the spouse and the family are safer without the narcissist, but it's still a system. And the same competition, devaluing, discard, microaggression, gaslighting, all of that is still going to happen after the divorce. So I, I wanted to begin with this because I've been thinking a lot about it. I'm not a legal expert, but I've just been thinking about how so many of these patterns continue, if not get worse, within a core process. And I wanted to weave this into the discussion about narcissistic family systems, which completely look like and are mirrored in court systems. I think that lawyers and mediators, assessors, I think they all do their best to understand this dynamic. I think you need to be really close to the situation to see it. And I know that myself as a therapist uh, recently had to make a call, a child protection call, and my concerns were dismissed out of hand because they wrote it off, they wrote my complaint off because there was an ongoing court complaint. So that's a different rant for a different day. But there's, you know, an example of, in this case, CAS, I'm in Ontario, this Children's Aid Society, completely gaslighting me and the family that's affected. It is imperative that there be a way of characterizing some of this dynamic without using the word narcissism because I think it's overused and it's being used in inappropriate ways and in the wrong context and no one in the court system or CIS really cares about that language. It's not relevant to them. It is relevant in psychiatry where it is it could be relevant is if you could get a definitive diagnosis not that you're going to diagnose your partner although god love all of you for trying that leads to validating a question around the capacity to parent in narcissistic families there's always or typically if you're lucky i was not so lucky there is always a good enough parent who is holding down that attachment fort. This is part of the reason why we don't see family service agencies, child protective services engaging them in the way we need them to. This is also why this gets caught up in court. There's one parent who can buffer and mitigate the toxic effects of the other, okay? I'm just losing my train of thought now. Um, but this also happens, of course, in right in on divorced in I hate this word, I was going to say intact, I don't like the word. But in families who who are together, and there's a narcissist, there is still, you know, that 
one non-toxic parent or the better functioning parent or the least selfish parent who is taking care of the family and being sure that those the the family's needs are met and they are a corrective influence for those children. So this is something you will typically see in narcissistic families. At least this is how it is characterized. Unless you have a, a narcissist or someone with NPD and a, a parent who enables that or who may have their own character pathology. And I've heard that a lot as well. However, the popular media definitely characterizes an image of a parent who's narcissistic and a parent who is a saint. I almost dropped the F-bomb. Flag. Huge flag. Huge flag because a number of people who call out their spouses are narcissistic are the ones who are toxic, right? This is quieted down a little in my practice, but I, for a while, I saw a lot of it. Um, not, and, and I'm not characterizing that in a negative way. I'm just saying, I think that's the, the characterization we see a lot in the popular media. So although I had intended to come in and talk about <laughs> the roles of children within a narcissistic family system, I have been inspired this week because in reality, I'm pissed off. So saying I'm inspired is a bit euphemistic. But um, this, this epiphany I've had or this reminder of how difficult it is for court and family systems to recognize these dynamics when it's really happening and how in fact families go on to repeat the dynamic and have it mirrored within the court system itself. And so in this situation, Children become part of the narcissist transaction. They are the currency where the transactional nature of the relationship plays out or the currency that supports that transaction. So whether that's around money, benefits, what a parent is paying or not paying, this whole, this really bothers me, this whole idea that I, if I don't see my kids, I'm not paying really, really bugs me. This whole idea that a narcissistic parent doesn't have to uphold a children's interests and passions, right? If any of you have had a narcissistic parent, you will know that either they projected their goals and passions onto you and supported that, or you were like a show pony, right? And you were out there to make them look good in a performative part of yourself, or they ignored and disregarded what you were interested in altogether. This 100% plays out once there is not that cohesiveness among parents and the narcissistic parent is a bit more sovereign in, in how they're able to do things which of course leads to feelings of great shame and guilt in the parent who is not narcissistic, although you need not feel that way because your role is even more important than it ever was. So in, th in these narcissistic families, there will always be people who have a role in mitigating the toxic, toxic, toxic wounding, be that a teacher, a grandparent, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, community members, coaches, right? Something that that's really dear to my heart. So again, my plan was to come in and talk about the dynamics of narcissistic family systems. And I felt that this was the appropriate place to integrate uh, some of the current realities about the, the court system. There need to be mechanisms in place where families have someone they can turn to, be that an ombudsman, a trustee of some sort. If 
the child's needs are being overlooked because of a court proceeding. They should be separate. They should be separate. A child's needs very likely increase during the intensity of court negotiations. So I'm calling out on social workers, therapists, psychologists, lawyers, advocacy groups. I'm sure they're out there. But this is just from my little corner of the world. Um, you know, hopefully speaking light into truth on this one. So one of the platforms of my work is wanting to see more compassion and empathy in any kind of system. So I would like to see that happen there. We're all on the same side, I think, right? Um, no parents' rights are ever violated in upholding and nurturing the needs of a child. And on that note, um, I will bid you all adieu until I post the next video. And if this has message has resonated with you, please join the conversation uh, either here in YouTube or um, look me up on social media at Stacy Sanderson at Inquire Within. Um, there's a group there called Inquire Within, Finding and Nurturing Your True Self, where the, there's a safety in that conversation. And like and subscribe and share so we can invite more people into this conversation. And so that for any of you who are feeling alone, right, this, this creates such loneliness you will be reminded that you aren't. Take care until next time. And thank you so much for listening.